My lab is interested in epigenetic inheritance. I think for this meeting, we want to make the distinction between epigenetic inheritance and epigenetic marks. So something that is epigenetically heritable is a phenotype that differs between two organisms with the same genome, uh, but then can be inherited in a non-DNA-based manner. Uh, so the classic version of this is cell state inheritance. All the cells in your body have the same genome, but when a liver cell divides, it never makes a skin cell or a kidney cell, despite the fact that they share the same genome. So state liverness is an epigenetically heritable state. Um, decades of study of cell state inheritance, uh, for example, in Drosophila, uh, have identified many of the sort of major epigenetic information carriers. So in Drosophila, cell state inheritance depends on polycomb and trithorax group uh, genes. Uh, these turn out to be chromatin regulators, so that's one of the famous epigenomes. Uh, here you have cytosine methylation. Uh, the other major epigenome is, is small RNAs. Um, in budding yeast, prions also play a much bigger role than they, they seem to in other organisms. So, uh, of course, this is mitotic. Cell state inheritance is mitotic epigenetic inheritance. Uh, and when we divide, this is not the way we do it. Uh, we, of course, go through the choke point of the uh, gametes. Uh, so for any information to be transmitted transgenerationally or intergenerationally from uh, one generation to the next requires that you go uh, survive all of this sort of massive packaging and informational uh, changes that occurred during gametogenesis. And then that information at the moment of fertilization has to sort of unroll over the course of development to give you a, uh, a coherent phenotype. Uh, so this, of course, is a much uh, different beast than cell state inheritance. Uh, nonetheless, it turns out that the same epigenetic marks that you see in cell state inheritance uh, also can be heritable in the gametes from one generation to the next. Uh, probably the first example of this was discovered by Brinks and Co. in the 1950s. It's called paramutation. Uh, and here in studies of maize coloration, they found that um, uh, my laser weapon has died. Um, they found that um, uh, green plants, which are repressing a gene called B, when mated to purple plants, which express the gene called B, uh, the progeny of a cross between these will uh, turn off the, the pigment gene. Ah, beautiful. Okay. Um, so this would look like a sort of, uh, you know, big A, big A, little a, little a in Mendelian inheritance, and this would be a heterozygote. But if you keep back crossing these to purple plants, you keep converting them green. So in other words, this piece of DNA is infectious and converts the paramutable allele um, to the paramutant allele. Okay, so this is the first example, and this, of course, is going from one maze generation to the next. Okay, so it's being passed through the gametes. Now, the fact that this kind of information does make it into the gametes, along with the fact that epigenetic information, unlike DNA sequence, can respond to the environment, right? So in budding yeast, if you put them into higher temperatures, you get tons of chromatin changes, um, uh, has sort of led to the, uh, the sort of re-taking seriously uh, of the idea that the environment in one generation could affect the phenotype of the next generation. Um, and so this is often called Lamarckian inheritance, uh, although that's sort of a misnomer. Um, I mostly show this slide because there's a funny story attached to it, although um, at least a third or half of you have heard the story before, so if you haven't, I'll tell you at the bar. Um, but so the, uh, the classic test of Lamarckian inheritance came from August Weissman. Uh, this is the guy who defined the soma germline distinction in the 19th century. What he did is he cut the tails off of mice, mated them to each other, measured tail length and offspring. He found no difference in tail length uh, and therefore concluded that the environment in one generation doesn't affect the phenotype in the next. Now, there are a bunch of problems with that experiment. Um, one of them is that if, uh, if someone's cutting your tail off, maybe the thing to tell your kids is not to have a shorter tail, but to run away from people in lab coats. Um, so, uh, but nonetheless, this type of experiment is the kind of paradigm that we and many other people have revisited in the past uh, five, ten years. Uh, so that's all the preamble, and now I'm going to get into the, the business. Okay, so um, we do these studies as paternal effect studies. Uh, the reason for this is that 
in mammals, uh, of course, mom is baby's first environment. So, um, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome isn't magic and epigenetic, you're just poisoning a fetus. Uh, whereas with dads, um, you can set up the mating so that dad basically just leaves sperm in a memory. Uh, and so there we can much more clearly focus on gamete carried effects. So what we do is we split male mice to two different conditions. Um, we primarily are using, uh, well, the one we've used for the longest is a dietary condition. In the last third of the talk, I'll tell you about a new paradigm we have that we're really excited about based on nicotine. But we'll start with diet. We split uh, siblings to control and low protein diet. We raise them to sexual maturity. Uh, we mate them to control females. We take them out of the cage after a day. Uh, so we're trying to minimize transfer of um, microbiota to the kids through defecation. Uh, we're certainly preventing the males from directly interacting with their kids. Uh, the females are pregnant, have children. At three weeks of age, we uh, grind up the kids. Uh, and unlike the Weissman experiment, where he measured one quantitative trait, tail length, uh, we measure 30,000 by doing genome-wide gene expression profiling uh, of the livers, I forgot to mention. So uh, it turns out hundreds of genes in the liver can tell what diet father ate. Um, the RNA from uh, low-protein-sired an low protein animals is uh, labeled red and control is green. So red genes are upregulated if your dad ate a low-protein diet. Uh, and as you can see, this is fairly coherent, although in no case is it completely penetrant. Uh, and we see upregulation of two to 300 genes. Um, these genes are very strongly enriched for genes in, involved in cholesterol and lipid biosynthesis. Um, it turns, so we next asked whether or not this is just a gene expression um, phenotype or whether or not there's a metabolic phenotype underlying this. And so when we measure meta, uh, metabolite levels in the liver, uh, what we see is a very dramatic decrease in cholesterol esters as well as a, a more subtle decrease in free cholesterol. So um, we're not going to get into phenotyping these animals any more uh, than this. Uh, but people who know about metabolism say that a, um, an effect preferentially on cholesterol esters sounds like a bile acid effect uh, or a bile acid phenotype. So perhaps what's happening with the low protein kids is that they're dumping bile acids for whatever reason, uh, running out of cholesterol and cholesterol esters, and then homeostatically upregulating cholesterol biosynthesis to keep up, okay? So this is what the phenotype looks like. Now it turns out that there are a bunch of other rodent systems that um, came out around the same time as ours and in the ensuing years. Uh, this is a, a very incomplete listing. Uh, in general, people find, um, so here you have uh, rats um, where the fathers are eating high fat diet. Here's a system very much like ours. Um, in general, the phenotypes people see are either glucose control, that's the majority of what people look at, uh, and in some cases they also find uh, cholesterol metabolism much like us. Um, I think the main distinction to make here that I find very interesting is that um, in our system and the, in these top two systems, the animals are being treated from weaning onwards. So they're being treated postnatally. Um, in more systems, uh, including, uh, so Ann Ferguson Smith will be giving uh, a talk tomorrow. Uh, she and Mary Elizabeth Patty, and then a couple other people, Tracy Bale in particular, um, use these systems where you starve a pregnant female, okay? and her son in utero is the treated generation father. And the point there is that they're manipulating uh, dad's nutrition while primordial germ cell development is occurring, okay? So I think this is going to be a big difference um, in systems between those where you're messing with PGC development and those where you're messing with uh, postnatal germ cell epigenetics, okay? But in all of these cases, what's happening is you're linking paternal dietary conditions to offspring metabolic phenotype. Uh, this also shows up in human epidemiology, this link between ancestral food and future metabolism, uh, most famously in the so-called Dutch hunger winter. I'm going to assume everyone in this room knows about these systems. Uh, the, these are sort of like probably the, uh, the motivating um, examples that drove many of you into this field. Uh, but so in the Dutch hunger winter, of course, the Nazis starved the Dutch people. They were Nazis. Um, 
uh, children who are in utero during the Dutch hunger winter um, now and in adulthood have significantly elevated rates of diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. So that's a maternal effect. Uh, there's also a evidence from male line effect in the so-called Uvercalix cohort. Uh, this is work from uh, Marcus Pembry, who's here, along with Kati and Bygren. Uh, and basically what they found is that uh, paternal grandfather's food supply um, was linked to his grandson's relative risk of mortality, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, so this is paternal grandfather. So this is a male line effect. Okay? So in all of these systems, there's evidence both in mice and in the humans, uh, and there are other systems like in pigs. Uh, there's a link between ancestral food supply and future metabolic phenotype. So how does this work? Now, uh, the natural uh, assumption slash hypothesis is that males are going to be sending information to their kids in the sperm epigenome. Um, we should just point out for completeness that there are other ways that fathers can talk to their children. Uh, one of these is seminal fluid. Uh, there is a great literature in Drosophila on seminal fluid peptides affecting offspring in various ways. Uh, there's also some evidence in mammals for this, uh, prostaglandins in particular. Um, there's also really groovy literature in birds uh, where females can judge males and change how they re allocate resources accordingly. Uh, so ask me at the bar about Goldie and Finches, we call these cryptic maternal effects. Uh, and I alluded also to the idea of the microbiome, where dad could be passing microbiota on to kids. Um, so how do we separate these from each other? Um, what we've ended up doing is turning to in vitro fertilization, where you purify the gametes uh, away from all of these other things, uh, mix them together, make a zygote, implant it into a pseudo-pregnant female, and analyze the child. Um, and so we actually, all the reproduction in our lab now goes through IVF because it has a number of advantages. Uh, this is a bummer for the mice because that's all they had. Um, but so we managed over the course of several years to produce one supplemental figure uh, where we show that we can uh, recapitulate the effect of low protein diet just using purified sperm, okay? Uh, so as you might have assumed, the information in our system is in sperm or co-purifies with sperm. Okay. Um, so assuming that this was going to be the case, we long ago started uh, epigenomic profiling of mouse sperm. Um, I will not give you any evidence, but uh, we have published our feelings on the matter. Uh, we don't think the answer is going to be chromatin packaging. We don't think the answer is going to be cytosine methylation. Uh, our best lead is in small RNAs. Um, small RNAs are, of course, central to some of the best characterized transgenerational epigenetic inheritance systems like paramutation in maize or RNAi and C. elegans. Um, it's a bummer for me that the answer is, is small RNAs because I'm at UMass Med School, which means um, I am now like the 50th best person at my own institution at what I do for a living. Um, but on the other hand, I get the, uh, the advantage of all my colleagues' expertise. Um, so I'll tell you about small RNAs in sperm uh, for the rest of this section. So uh, what do we do? We uh, purify and deep sequence small RNAs from mature sperm. Uh, mature sperm have a very unusual small RNA profile. This is the size distribution of small RNAs uh, as well as their abundance. Um, you can see a little peak here at 21 nucleotides for microRNAs, um, which would be the dominant species in somatic cells. But in sperm, roughly 80% of RNAs are 28 to 32 nucleotide, five prime ends of tRNAs, okay? So these are called tRNA fragments or TERFs. Um, they're all from the five prime end. Um, they are typically uh, clipped in the anticodon, and for each different tRNA fragment, there's a characteristic series of processing intermediates. Um, this is the most abundant uh, small RNA in sperm. This is 20% of all small RNAs in, in mouse sperm, turf glue CTC. This is the second most abundant RNA, turf glide GCC, then Valcac. Uh, and so it turns out when we compare con uh, control and low protein sperm, we see about a threefold upregulation of turf glide GCC. 
There are another eight or nine RNAs that change. I'm going to tell you the whole story with Turf Glide GCC, but it's worth being aware that there are other interesting RNAs changing. So I would not necessarily claim that this RNA is uh, the whole story, but everything we've done with this RNA has turned out interesting. Okay, so why are we going to follow up on this RNA? Um, first of all, of course you would tell your kids about a low-protein diet using uh, small RNAs made from tRNAs. Small RNAs are how parents talk to kids. tRNAs are a pretty obvious way to see metabolism. Um, second of all, this is the second most abundant RNA in sperm. Sperm carry very little RNA relative to the oocyte. They are both about a thousand-fold smaller, and they have less RNA on a per femtoliter basis. So for the sperm to contribute anything meaningful to the zygote, it's going to have to be one of the most abundant RNAs in sperm. Uh, and then finally, and this is really the reason we got into this, and this turns out to be a fabulous red herring, um, it turns out that, um, and I think this, this will be a generational split. Everyone above 40 knows this, and everyone below 40 doesn't. Um, tRNAs are universally involved in LTR element replication. Okay? So uh, here's HIV. So this is both LTR retroviruses, but this is also true of LTR endogenous retroviruses. So the RNA genome is packaged in the virion with a tRNA bound to something called the primer binding sequence. Um, in the wild, tRNAs are the primers for reverse transcriptase. So when HIV infects a cell, uh, RT primes off the tRNA, makes the cDNA to one long terminal repeat. That cDNA comes over to the other LTR, and you make the whole genome. This is universally conserved, despite the sort of arms race between hosts and pathogens that's going on all the time, uh, to the extent where there's a very compelling hypothesis that the ER function of tRNAs in the RNA world was as a replication factor, and they've been moonlighting in translation for a billion years. Now, I tell you this because um, you can imagine that by clipping your tRNAs, you could fight off an endogenous retro element, mm -hmm. either by directing an argonaut to clip the primer binding sequence, or by displacing the tRNA that's uh, being used as a primer, et cetera, et cetera. So people talk about pi RNAs as a genomic adaptive immune system. tRNA fragments could act as a genomic innate immune system, right? Any retro element I could get from anyone in this room, um, even if my genome's never seen it, I could fight off by clipping my own tRNAs. So uh, this caught our attention because epigenetics is generally first about control of selfish elements that then gets co-opted for other forms of regulation. So we're going to chase turf glide GCC. I'll sometimes call it turf GG for short. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about its biogenesis and then a little bit about its function. In terms of biogenesis, um, as we're trying to figure out how the regulation of levels of this turf work, uh, we came to realize that this turf probably is not um, generated in the testis during the process of spermatogenesis. In fact, we couldn't really find turfs in the testis, even though the testis is 80% sperm. Um, so here's a bunch of purified uh, testicular uh, sperm precursors, as well as mature testicular spermatozoa. Uh, their small RNA content is shown as a pie chart. Green is pi RNAs. Uh, turfs are in red. Now, um, normally when you collect sperm for IVF or other things, you collect them from this uh, organ called the epididymis. Uh, from the cauda epididymis, and you can see here what I told you before, that the RNA in these sperm is primarily TERFs, okay? So, um, in fact, what we found is, so the epididymis is a long convoluted tube. Sperm spend about two weeks maturing in the epididymis. Um, it's the least studied organ in the body. Um, it's not clear why they take two weeks to go through it, but they do learn how to swim as they're going through. Um, you go from proximal to distal, the caput, corpus, and cauda epididymis. Uh, this is the storage organ, and then ejaculation proceeds through the vas deferens here. So as soon as sperm uh, enter the epididymis, even in caput epididymis, they already have huge levels of turf, whereas the latest sperm we could find in the testis does not have any turf. Um, this led us to think that perhaps tRNA fragments were being generated in the epididymis. Uh, so here's a uh, northern blot of, of two of our favorite tRNAs. You can see, like I told you, there's no cleavage of tRNAs in the testis. <coughs> just the intact tRNAs, but the somatic tissues of the epididymis have very robust uh, five prime fragments of tRNAs. Um, so this led us to, to imagine that maybe these tRNA fragments are getting shipped to maturing sperm. Um, and so 
Um, several things are known about what the epididymis does to sperm. One of them is that it ships over uh, on the order of 100 proteins in these little vesicles that would typically be called exosomes. In this tissue, they're called epididymosomes. Exosomes are also famous for carrying small RNAs around, uh, and so we asked whether or not um, epididymosomes are carrying tRNA fragments. Um, so, of course, they're actually quite easy to purify, uh, and sequencing RNAs from these is what we call epidemiological epididymosomal epigenomics, um, or as Yob Decker wants me to call it, 3E. Um, so, it turns out that epididymosomes have a nearly perfect match for the small RNA payload of sperm. Um, and the exception that proves the rule is that uh, pi RNAs, which came during testicular spermatogenesis, are quite sperm enriched. And not only that, but we can recapitulate this, uh, this delivery process in vitro. So we can take immature sperm, fuse them with vesicles, repurify the sperm, and we can deliver tRNA fragments to immature sperm. Um, here I'm showing you kappa toccata. Uh, we've more recently uh, reconstituted the step of testicular sperm to caput, uh, which is actually much nicer data because you go from no turf at all to lots of turf, whereas from caput to cotta, you're just changing uh, levels of a couple specific ones. So um, I'd say we're 95% sure that uh, the small RNAs in mature sperm are generated in the somatic tissues of the epididymis and then shipped over into maturing sperm. Um, this is compelling for two reasons. Um, one of them is that some reported paternal effect paradigms operate within uh, a week or two of copulation, uh, and that's too short for testicular effects to, um, for effects on the testis to affect sperm that are being used in that reproduction step. Uh, the other is that it turns out that in a wide variety of gametogenesis systems, Small RNA biogenesis involves a soma to germline communication step. Uh, so this is a review from Vonnet and Borchis. Uh, but this happens in flies, worms, ciliates. Uh, my favorite example is Rob Martinson's work in pollen. Um, a pollen crane has two sperm nuclei and a vegetative nucleus in a little sac. Uh, the vegetative nucleus releases its transposons from repression. It commits suicide by transposon. They trash the genome with double-strand breaks. Uh, but in doing so, it's revealed the transposons, <coughs> uh, which can then be clipped into little antiviral RNAs and shipped over to sperm nuclei. So what we think we've done is stumbled into the mammalian spermatogenesis version of this soma to germline communication. Of course, uh, in our case, it's quite different from all of these other examples in that it's a vesicle-based trafficking as opposed to a bunch of nuclei in, in the same uh, cytoplasm. So, um, this highlights what I think is one of the, uh, the few advantages of the mammalian system. Uh, you know, we're not going to be able to do a genetic screen in the mammalian system, or rather we can, but that'll be the rest of my career. Um, but what is unique about the mammalian system is the ability to uh, mechanically disassemble and reassemble the act of reproduction. Okay? And what I mean by that is that, um, thanks to the development of assisted reproductive technologies for humans, uh, we can take sperm from the testis or the caput or the cotta, or different parts of the male reproductive tract. We can generate embryos by either IVF or if the sperm don't know how to swim, ICSI, where you just inject the sperm head into the oocyte. Uh, we can then develop those embryos uh, in the culture. Um, we can implant them into females like we did to do IVF to test whether information was in sperm. And we can do all of that with or without reconstituting these sperm. In other words, taking testicular sperm and fusing them with caput epididymosomes first. Okay? We can also ask whether or not the, the vesicles from the male are communicating with the female reproductive tract. So we can play these mix and match games where we take sperm from different places, vesicles from different places, put the vesicles in the sperm into the oocyte, as well as put vesicles into the female reproductive tract. So this is, I think, a really unique uh, mix and match kind of system for mammals. Um, now, we're doing some of this where we're implanting embryos, but for now what we've really focused on is molecularly characterizing the effects on early development. So I'll just show you one, uh, I'll show you a couple slides about this. Um, the way we do this is we adapt single cell RNA-seq methods to single embryos. Um, this is our first 600 embryos. We now have something like five to 6,000. Uh, 
Basically, we carry out IVF, develop the embryos to different stages, and then carry out single embryo RNA-seq. Um, this data looks much nicer than single lymphocyte kind of things because you just have much more RNA in a single embryo. Um, so this is principal component analysis. Uh, the first two principal components are maternally derived transcripts, which are basically being lost from the two cell stage onwards. Uh, and then principal component two is the zygotic genome activation program. This occurs in the two cell stage in mouse. So you can see uh, two cell embryos before ZGA, ZGA is occurring, high levels of ZGA transcripts getting degraded. So this very nicely turns time into, a, um, into an angle. So uh, embedded in this is our bunch of experiments. Uh, so as far as the mechanical disassembly, et cetera, um, what we've been doing is basically carrying out ICSI with cauda sperm or caput sperm, developing them to blastocysts, and then carrying out single embryo RNA-seq. And it turns out that there are um, six or seven genes that very uh, significantly change. Uh, and these are actually significant even by normal RNA-seq statistics. Uh, usually single cell data sets don't give you this. Um, and I'm telling you this just to point out that these are actually very, very dramatic uh, gene expression changes. Um, so here are the caput-derived blasts having much higher levels of TDGF1, BMP4, ETV5. When we look these up, it turns out all of these are markers um, of epiblast. There are three cell types in the blastocyst, IC, uh, inner cell, sorry, the, the trophectoderm, epiblast, and hypoblast. Uh, these are all markers of the epiblast. We don't think it's that there's a change in the number of epiblast cells because of the 20 markers, only six of them are changing. The rest of the markers don't change. Um, but it turns out that these are all related to TGF beta signaling. So depending on, now we took these sperm from the same epididymis, right? We'd take one epididymis and pull a sperm from the caput or the cauda and make these embryos. So just how long you've matured in the epididymis affects this major early developmental pathway, which is TGF beta signaling. So first of all, this will make predictions about what's going to happen about gastrulation. Um, but more interesting from our point of view is that we can now use this as a sort of biomarker and ask whether or not we can restore caput sperm's ability to, to uh, support high levels of TGF beta signaling by fusing caput sperm with epididymosomes. And then if that works, we can take the, the cauda epididymosomes, isolate RNA, and microinject it into caput derived embryos. So this is where we're sort of playing these mix and match games for, for post-testicular development. Now, in terms of our favorite turf, turf glycine GCC, uh, there we have a fairly, um, at this point, we've, we understand how it works pretty well. Uh, so we started out looking at turf glycine GCC in embryonic stem cells. So when we knock out turf GG and then we look at RNA by microarray or RNA-seq, uh, in the turf knockdown cells, we get this dramatic derepression of about 50 genes. Um, it's very reproducible. We have like 15 replicates now. Um, it doesn't occur when you knock down other isoacceptors. It doesn't occur when you knock down tRNA glide GCC from the other end. So we really think it's the TERF and not the tRNA. Uh, so what are these genes? <coughs> it turns out every single one of them has been previously described to be regulated by an endogenous retrovirus named MERV-L. Okay? So we legitimately got into this, uh, this turf because of a connection between tRNAs and endogenous retroelements. Uh, and <laughs> um, sure enough, what we see is that um, when we mess with the turf, we have an effect on endogenous retroelement driven transcription. So these guys, often it's a solo LTR uh, that's being used as the promoter of a gene. So I will come back in a couple slides to how this works. Um, this is the red herring. Right, this, this turf has nothing to do with MERV-L. Like the L in MERV-L stands for, uses leucine tRNA as a primer. Um, so we'll get into the mechanism for this in a few slides. Um, first, I just want to point out that this regulation occurs not just in ES cells, but also in embryos. So we're inferring that turf glycine represses MERV-L genes. Uh, so low protein sperm, which have more turf glycine, should generate embryos with lower expression of MERV-L. Um, 
And sure enough, that's what we see here. This is the MERV-L program in a cumulative distribution plot. A shift to the left is down regulation. Um, we can make control embryos and then take control or low protein sperms, small RNA, and microinject that and get the same effect. Okay, so you don't need the nucleus for this. And we can also recapitulate this with synthetic turf glide GCC. Okay, so um, turf glycine GCC represses MERV-L um, both in the embryo and in embryonic stem cells. Um, we don't have a, uh, any great evidence for how regulation of Mervell affects metabolism, but I will speculate about this for the next two slides. Um, so Mervell is a uh, is a now well known to um, to mouse developmental biologists uh, retro element. Um, Merv L, the endogenous retroelement itself, and about 200 genes associated with it, uh, is turned on at zygotic genome activation in the two cell stage. Uh, it's off by the time you're a blastocyst when you're expressing OCT4. Uh, what Faf and McFarlane showed, so it's on in totipotent embryos. Uh, totipotent meaning that you can make both the embryo itself, which would be pluripotent, but also extra embryonic tissues. Faf and McFarlane showed that on the order of 2% of embryonic stem cells are OCT4 negative, but express the Mervell positive state, um, both Mervell and all of these associated genes. Um, if you fact sort out an OCT4 positive ES cell and aggregate it into an embryo, it contributes to the inner cell mass, but not to the trophectoderm, uh, and therefore to the embryo, but not the extra embryonic tissues. This is why ES cells are called pluripotent. If you fact sort out the Mervell positive cell, it contributes to the inner cell mass and the trophectoderm, and therefore both to the embryo and the placenta. Um, so the Mervell positive state is functionally totipotent. Um, and so our speculation is that all of the phenotypes we see in paternal effect paradigms, glucose control, cholesterol metabolism, all show up when you mess with the placenta, okay? So if you starve a pregnant mom or if you tie off the uterine artery, you will get these kinds of metabolic phenotypes. So what we speculate is that by um, regulating either the amplitude or the perdurance of the totipotent state, uh, turf glycine regulation of MERV-L affects the first sulfate allocation into TE versus ICM, thereby affecting placentation versus embryo growth per se. And all of the metabolic phenotypes we see are basically cryptic downstream effects of placentation. So we don't have any evidence for this, but this is um, the most credible link we have between uh, a molecular change in the early embryo and a metabolic phenotype in kids. Um, okay, so now coming back to how turf glycine regulates MERV-L, uh, there's this link between tRNAs and endogenous retroviruses, so we wanted to ask whether or not uh, MERV-L target genes are being regulated transcriptionally or post-transcriptionally. We do that with uh, metabolic labeling. This is effectively nuclear run-ons. And so what we see here is the, if you knock down turf glycine, you see an upregulation of these target genes in terms of total RNA. That upregulation is completely captured by newly synthesized RNA. So it looks like we're actually regulating MERV-L driven transcription rather than post-transcriptional <laughs> RNA stability, okay? So in other words, this is very unlikely to be an argonaut mediated mechanism. Um, you can also see an increase in RNA pull 2 at our favorite target genes. And we can pull the LTR out of the genome and, and run GFP with it. So it doesn't need to be at a particular chromosomal position. Uh, so we think that turf glycine is regulating MERV-L-driven transcription. Um, so how does that work? We know a reasonable amount about how LTR elements are repressed. Um, they're typically repressed by chromatin-based mechanisms, uh, where zinc finger factors bring heterochromatic uh, histone-modifying enzymes to repress them. It also turns out that LTR elements in general are very opportunistic about chromatin underassembly. So if you delete chromatin assembly factor in budding yeast, you derepress TY1, which is an LTR element. Maria Elena Torres Padilla showed that in mouse ES cells, knockdown of CAF1 released MERV L from repression. Um, so I have a postdoc, Anna Boscovich, who came from Maria Elena's lab, and she thought that maybe what turf glycine was doing to regulate this transcription was affecting global chromatin. And her hypothesis was that it occurred by regulating the histone genes themselves. 
Um, and the reason for that, which I thought was ridiculous, uh, and I told her that, uh, and I said, but knock yourself out. It's great to chase ridiculous ideas. Um, and she was totally right. Uh, her reason for this is that uh, histone transcripts, uh, uniquely among protein coding transcripts, don't use polyadenylation as their three prime end. They use this little stem loop called the histone stem loop, uh, which binds something called stem loop binding protein and then directs cleavage uh, and then supports translation. And she thought that half of a tRNA might look like the histone stem loop and might regulate the histones. Um, so we went back and redid our RNA-seq protocols in ways that don't require poly-A, like all RNA-seq protocols are poly-A dependent. Uh, and sure enough, we see when we knock down turf glycine, we see a decrease in histone message. This you can see genome-wide. Um, just for people who are, who are you know, keeping uh, the direction of the signs going, um, it's not the take case that turf glycine is, is soaking up SLBP uh, because turf glycine seems to um, support histone uh, transcript stability. Okay, so it's not that you're squelching or something. It goes the wrong direction. Um, here's qPCR data for the histones. So when we knock down turf glycine, we decrease histone message. When we transfect in the turf, we increase histone message. So this is really nice because now we have a gain of function. Almost everything else I told you about was these sort of antisense LNAs. Um, we can recapitulate this by quantitative Western blot. Uh, when we do a tax seek to look at global chromatin accessibility, um, we see an increase in accessibility over merv -L. Um, So all of these things are supporting the idea that turf glycine is regulating histone message abundance. Uh, and then the killer experiment from my point of view is that we wanted to know how it's doing it at, you know, is it the histone promoter, the coding region, or the three prime end? So Anna made several stable cell lines with his luciferase hooked up to the histone three prime UTR, and we can recapitulate the same thing. So knockdown of turf glycine gives you less luciferase activity, and transfection of the turf increases luciferase activity. So we are regulating the histones through the stem loop at the three prime UTR. Okay. Um, so our hypothesis now for what's going on um, is based on the fact that in many organisms, uh, zygotic genome activation, the timing of it is set by when you run out of histones, okay? So basically you're loaded up with some amount of histones and different organisms will take different amounts of time until ZGA. Um, but when you run out of histones, then the zygotic genome activation program fires. And so what we think we're doing by regulating histone message is basically accelerating or decelerating ZGA. Okay, so we think this Mervell thing, the red herring, Mervell just happens to be the opportunistic thing that fires at ZGA. So the link between the turf and Mervell has nothing to do with this ancient link between tRNAs uh, and herbs. Um, there's another nice point to make about this, but uh, seeing where we are on time, I will make it uh, during questions. Um, we don't know how turf glycine regulates the histone 3 prime UTR. We're working on it. We do have one nice um, uh, handle, <coughs> which is that what I didn't tell you when I showed you this data is that um, it turns out tRNAs are wildly covalently modified. Um, 20 to 40 percent of tRNA nucleotides are not AGCU. Uh, they include methyl C, uh, pseudouridine, these arcane ones like MCMSU. So when we transfected this turf, we used a correctly modified tRNA fragment. When we transfected naked turf, it doesn't stabilize the histone message as much. So this is interesting both in terms of um, dads being forced to send their kids an honest signal. Um, it's hard to fake a correctly modified turf by just encoding a little stem loop. Uh, but also it gives us, you know, we can biotinylate this and we have a really nice control for pull downs and stuff. Okay. Um, so that's where we are with the low protein system. Uh, but all of this raises a question that we've thought about for a long time, and it really forces us to confront the question of specificity. <coughs> right? So in principle, um, this is just sort of a, a cartoon of everything, but we'll just keep going. <coughs> in principle, with cytosine methylation, you can transmit every CPG is a bit of information. So you could transmit very high bandwidth information to your kids. Like, you know, 
There were abundant oysters. It was cold. Uh, there was a kind of mold that grew on red berries, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> um, whereas if we're correct about a tRNA fragment accelerating ZGA or decelerating it, that's more consistent with <coughs> very nonspecific transfer of information from parent to kid. <coughs> Sorry about that. <coughs> So maybe you only tell your kid one overall quality of life measure. Like life was shitty, okay, or great. Um, so, or maybe, you know, we have three really abundant turfs. Maybe glue CTC tells you about uh, psychic stress. Glide GCC tells you about nutrition. <coughs> and Valcac tells you about water. And so what we've wanted to do for a long time is ask how specific the offspring phenotype is for the inciting stimulus. And so... <clears throat> For many years, we've been developing a system based on nicotine. Um, the reason being that nicotine enables pharmacological access to the specificity of the reprogrammed state. <clears throat> so what we do is we put males on nicotine in the drinking water or control solution. Uh, we withdraw them for a week so there's no nicotine in the ejaculate. <clears throat> Mate them to females. Uh, and then test the progeny for nicotine-related uh, phenotypes. And so uh, there are a bunch of phenotypes that don't change. So if you throw a mouse into a box, it'll run around uh, looking into the corners for food, and it'll cross a laser beam. If you first inject it with nicotine, you suppress locomotor activity. Uh, and this does not change <coughs> depending on dad's nicotine exposure. So the next thing we do is a much more complicated assay. So they're not globally more or less nicotine sensitive. The next thing we do is an assay for reward. So mice are smart. They won't take nicotine on purpose. Well, they're not that smart. <coughs> um, so what you have to do is you put a catheter into the heart. Um, you starve them for a week and train them to press a lever for food. By the time they're good at that, you put them into the testing box. You hook them up to a catheter. And then... When they push the button, instead of getting food, they get a pulse of nicotine. And by the time they realize the switcheroo, um, they're now addicted to nicotine and will self-administer. And you can now measure how much nicotine they take over the course of you know, a month and a half of escalating nicotine doses. So it turns out there's no difference at all in how much nicotine they take. But uh, Marcus Fallister, the student doing this, is uh, super observant. Um, and he noticed that what was going on is that all of the control animals died, uh, whereas the nicotine animals survived much deeper into the assay. Okay, so you can see this here uh, with the survival curve. Um, the nicotine animals are significantly more resistant to nicotine toxicity than control animals. I'll show you in a couple slides that we can actually just reproduce this with an LD50 injection. Uh, so this, was, this laborious self-administration assay was a long walk for a short drink of water. Um, but I still have to show it because I, I love that this is how we got there. So, paternal nicotine administration gives you kids who are resistant to nicotine toxicity. So this sounds adaptive, it sounds really specific, it's beautiful. <coughs> but nicotine resistance could occur either very specifically, you could downregulate nicotinic acetylcholine receptor 4 in the hippocampus, uh, nicotine kills animals by seizures that originate in the hippocampus. Um, or it could be somewhat nonspecific, like xenobiotic resistance. So we're testing the difference between these, both molecularly and phenotypically. The phenotyping is more interesting. Uh, so the first thing we're going to try to do is we're going to try to kill animals with other drugs. Uh, one of them is cocaine. Uh, this also kills animals by seizure, but of course doesn't op operate through nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So that can distinguish the receptor from blood-brain barrier, excitotoxicity, and uh, xenobiotic uh, clearance. Um, and then to sort of kill animals by something that doesn't induce seizures, uh, we also use jet fuel. Um, so my, I have young kids at home, and they saw me making this slide, and they're like, what's that, Daddy? It's like, oh, it's <laughs> the bad decisions. Um, but so, and now our, our lab motto is Coke, smokes, and gasoline. Okay, so we're going to try to kill animals with uh, cocaine, and actually I won't show you any jet fuel data. Um, first, what I should point out is that I told you that <coughs> nicotine kids are resistant to nicotine. 
you can't actually recreate that the first time you do it when you inject naive animals with nicotine. So this is us finding the LD50. This is the percentage of animals surviving. <coughs> and if anything, the nicotine kids are dying, uh, you know, it's not significant, but they're dying more than the control animals. And so what happens in the self-administration paradigm is they're on nicotine for a month before they hit the lethal dose. So we wondered whether or not they have to be acclimated to nicotine to become resistant. And so now what we do is we put animals on six days of chronic nicotine and then challenge them. And sure enough, we now have a very significant increase in resistance. So this point is really important, right? Because it tells you that there's an epigene cross-environment effect. You need to uh, acclimate the animals to nicotine to reveal the reprogrammed epigenome. Uh, and I think, you know, Probably most of the people in this room are aware of this, but a lot of people have this idea that intergenerational reprogramming is this sort of eternal change in a mark that um, is sort of static. Uh, so for example, we've had reviewers complain about our pre-implantation gene expression because we don't see SREBP changing, right, cholesterol. Two, two cell embryos don't have livers, right? So you sort of need to get to the point where the animal has, has started to like respond to the environment in order to reveal these phenotypes. Okay, um, but so this is reproducing the self-administration toxicity. Okay, so now what happens with cocaine? Uh, with naive animals, um, there's no difference in cocaine resistance depending on, on paternal nicotine exposure. I told you that with nicotine, we have to pre-acclimate them to nicotine. So with cocaine, we pre-acclimate nicotine-sired kids to cocaine and then try to kill them with cocaine, and we see a significant resistance. Okay, so that tells us that the resistance in kids is not downregulation of nicotinic acetylcholine receptor 4. Um, so you can see I've left these two spaces blank. So is it that these animals are sort of hyper responsive to a specific drug, or do they turn on a sort of broadband xenobiotic response? So now we'll acclimate them to nicotine and kill them with cocaine. And pre exposure to nicotine protects them from cocaine and pre-exposure to cocaine protects them from nicotine. So basically, paternal nicotine exposure gives you kids who, once they see a xenobiotic, become better at resisting xenobiotics in general, okay? At least for the sort of spectrum from nicotine to cocaine. In terms of how it works, uh, we've been, um, yeah, so this could still be a blood-brain barrier, excitotoxicity, or hepatic, hepatic xenobiotics. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the hippocampus and there's no phenotype there we can find. On the other hand, we do find that the nicotine kids clear nicotine more quickly, so it, it looks like it's a xenobiotic response. Um, when we do RNA-seq in hepatocytes, we see an upregulation in nicotine hepatocytes to the xenobiotic response, uh, of the xenobiotic response. So I have three more slides, uh, and all of them are related to this question of why acclimation is necessary. So one hypothesis we had is um, that the nicotine kids would be sort of hyper-responsive to nuclear hormone receptor agonists. And so what we do now, and that's why nicotine induces a nicotine-resistant state. Um, so what we do is we take hepatocytes, uh, and then we subject them to different nuclear hormone receptor agonists, and we carry out RNA-seq. So we're trying to domesticate their responsiveness to the world. Okay, and so um, what we see, this is sort of a complicated slide, but I'll walk you through it. Um, what we see, here we're taking uh, the agonist for PPAR alpha. We've done this with many, many NHR agonists. When we take all the genes that in, in TA, in controlled hepatocytes, are upregulated by this agonist, so PPAR alpha targets. Okay, so this is, you know, this is a box plot. By definition, this is going to be above zero because we're defining these upregulated genes. Now when we take um, nicotine hepatocytes uh, without the agonist, we see that these genes are derepressed. That's basically what I showed you on the last slide. They have turned on the genes that will be activated by PPR alpha even when they don't see the agonist. When we give them the agonist, they do turn these genes on a little bit more but not as much as the control hepatocytes. And so if we compare the induced state, 
you can see that it's lower in the nicotine hepatocytes. So in other words, the floor is higher and the ceiling is lower. And this happens for a bunch of different agonists where they, the naive hepatocytes derepress these genes, but they don't induce as well. So it's not that they're hyper-responsive, it's actually that these hepatocytes are generalists. They're sort of anxiously detoxifying and storing and this kind of stuff, um, and they've turned on all nuclear hormone receptor genes a little bit, um, but they're not as good at responding to specific things. Uh, we repeated this whole experiment. Um, doesn't matter. Normally, you culture hepatocytes with dexamethasone to keep them alive, but we were worried that that was messing things up. But again, we see the exact same thing without dex. Okay, so um, this sort of raises the question of why acclimation helps. Because uh, naive hepatocytes are already turning on the xenobiotic response program, and yet naive animals are uh, no better at resisting toxic nicotine or cocaine. So why does acclimation make these animals better at this? So we tried to take hepatocytes from chronically treated animals uh, and carry out RNA-seq, and Marcus noticed that he couldn't get hepatocytes out of them. I mean, he could, but they just, they all looked like shit on the plate and we barely got any RNA. Uh, and so we sort of thought that there might be some, some toxicity in the liver. Um, and sure enough, when you stain control animals, so this is cocaine, acclimated on cocaine, you see a lot of periportal cell death, okay? Um, nicotine offspring, they're completely, uh, completely saved. And this is, I'm not just picking the two best images, you can sort of see like massively different amounts of, uh, of cell death. So we think what's happening with acclimation is actually that our fidgety animals, our generalists, who've upregulated the xenobiotic response, at sublethal doses of nicotine or cocaine, um, Normal animals are sort of losing hepatocytes, so they're losing liver function as they're being poisoned. Uh, the nicotine animals, by detoxifying, are maintaining hepatic function, and this is how acclimation works. I'll finally tell you one other thing. So we have nicotine in dads affects nicotine and cocaine in kids. So now the question is, how specific is the paternal stimulation? And so we did an experiment that was supposed to be a good experiment for one reason and turned out to be a good experiment for a different reason. So sort of our vision getting into this was that we'd be able to then ask in dads, because we're using something that has defined receptors, nicotine, we'd be able to ask, is nicotine being sensed centrally or in the testis? Um, you know, which receptor is it? We can flox things. And so we start out by treating dads with either mecamilamine, which is a nicotine antagonist, which can cross the blood-brain barrier, or hexamethonium, which is a nic nicotine antagonist that cannot. Um, and so here's again just control and nicotine um, dads, their kids acclimated and attempted to kill. So what happens when we put dads on nicotine and mecamilamine? And it turns out that they are just as resistant to nicotine, the kids are just as resistant to nicotine death as these guys. Okay, so that tells us we don't need the dads to go through withdrawal and we don't need them to actually have nicotine signaling. So this is sort of like impossible for Boolean logic, right? Nicotine and not nicotine are both true. Um, it also turns out <coughs> just the control, mecamilamine, will give us, when dads are just on nicotine antagonist, it's sufficient to give us some xenobiotic protection in the kids, not as much as nicotine. Um, but what all of this argues is that this phenotype is not induced by nicotine, it's induced by xenobiotics. So the short version of all of this is that what started out as this very specific nicotine in dads makes their kids nicotine resistance. It's beautiful and specific and adaptive. Um, it turns out that xenobiotics in dad affect xenobiotic, broadband xenobiotic resistance in kids. <coughs> um, so anyway, this is, I think I'm out of time. Uh, so this is the, the germ cycle. Um, and uh, I hope I've convinced you that uh, the environment in one generation can affect the phenotype in the next. Um, it's really worth thinking, uh, particularly in mammals, about sort of the moment of fertilization because uh, really anything you see in the adult offspring is a secondary or tertiary effect. Um, if you want to know what the gametes are doing, you should be looking at fertilization. Um, so I focused today on turf glycine regulating MERV-L. Uh, we're 95% sure that these small RNAs in sperm 
come to sperm via vesicles, <coughs> so by germline communication. Uh, we're regulating MERV-L by a very surprising mechanism, which is regulating uh, histone abundance and accelerating or decelerating ZGA. Um, we speculate that, that this affects placentation uh, by affecting the first cell fate decision between TE and ICM. And then finally, I think a really important point about the nicotine system is that the phenotype of an animal is only revealed by its interaction with the environment, and it's worth always keeping that in mind for these, uh, these kinds of systems. Um, so 90% 90, 90 of the work I told you about was carried out by a phenomenal postdoc, Upasna Sharma, who's on the job market this year. Uh, her partner in crime is Colin Conine, who was a student in Craig Mello's lab when he started working with us and is now a postdoc in the lab. Uh, he did, for example, all the caput cauda ICSI experiments. Um, Xin Yang Bing and Anna Boscovich are the two working on the turf regulation of histones. Uh, and then the nicotine system was developed by Marcus Vallister in collaboration with Andrew Tapper. Uh, and um, thanks, thanks for your attention. <coughs> I have two questions. One is about the histone regulation. So it's known that the canonical histones are regulated during the cell cycle. So if you think, with the cell cycle, if you think that perhaps the progression is different through the cleavages. So you're right. Know, so, so, so it's one, a kind of circular argument then. Well, so one possibility would be that we, we see an increase in histone uh, message because we've stalled them in S phase. Uh, so when we fax, you know, we fax profile them and also arrest and release. They don't have an S phase stall. They do have a little trouble getting out of G2M, but it's not that there are more cells in S phase. Um, so that's not how the regulation works. And the second question is, so all the ART approaches, so the culture media for the early, you know, for the early embryos, they are, we don't really know what the in vivo biochemically, you know, the fluid or whatever it is, uh, it is, and it's even less perhaps similar to in vivo in the case of human ART. So do, do you always see the same response when you do IVF and culture of early embryos versus flushed embryos from in vivo? Or perhaps by culturing them in a, in principle suboptimal uh, conditions, we make those responses or we potentiate the responses so we sensitize the system? Yeah, so I mean our fear for a long time, uh, so what you're alluding to is in part that the phenotypes you see in paternal effects, like glucose control and cholesterol, also show up when you culture an embryo. So our fear with the IVF experiments for a long time is that we might not be able to see low protein effects on cholesterol metabolism because IVF alone, the process of IVF would be sufficient to sort of, you know, cause all of that signaling to happen. Um, so the fact that we did reproduce it through IVF is actually a very conservative test, right? Um, we haven't done a lot of flushing natural embryos. We're doing a little bit of it in studies of maternal effects now. Um, but we haven't done a lot of flushing embryos. At some point, I would like to, just as a service to the community, like do a bunch of ICSI, IVF, natural embryos, you know, all on like the same day with the same, same colony. Uh, we haven't done much of that. Um, but what I can say is that <coughs> All of the kinds of things I've shown you, like the low protein versus control affecting MERV-L, you know, those are both, those are all internally controlled in terms of how we do the, the um, embryo generation. Um, it may be that by doing IVF, we're preventing ourselves from seeing other interesting stuff. Um, but at some point, we should probably uh, collect, you know, flushed embryos and, and check that out. One thing I like about ICSI, at least, is that relative to flushed embryos, with ICSI, you can stage embryos to the minute. And actually, when we do you know, 24 hours and 24 and a half hours, we can see very detailed dynamics of ZGA. So ICSI is really nice from that point of view in a way that you can't control with either IVF or flushing. So on, on the same note, it's, it's more of a technical comment question on, on what you think an an N of one is, particularly with these ICSI experiments. And the reason I ask is we know that during natural fertilization, not every single sperm has an equal chance 
to, you know, some sperm outperform the others, but in ICSI you take a random nu nucleus or pronucleus. Um, so just gen your general thoughts on it, because I think we know that a lot of, let's call it the intergeneral field, intergenerational field, does far too few n numbers, and the definitions become very diffuse once you start including multiple generations. What is an n of one? Does that mean one grand paternal into multiple parental and then F2? So any comments on what's an n of one in an ICSI type experiment and the relationship to, to uh, I'm not sure. I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Um, I mean, I think the question you're asking is, do you consider all the animals from a litter an N, or do you consider each animal an N? Is, is that the basis of the question? Yes, and the complication of, of pulling out random oh, ICSI nuclei I, yeah, so where they wouldn't all be random in, in nature. Yeah, so, um, I mean, generally speaking, all the experiments we do, so, right, so one thing we could have missed with ICSI would be if you had, um, you know, if you had a small population of sperm in an ejaculate who were really good at something, you know, getting past the uterotubular junction before it, you know, um, inflames closed or, you know, makes it all the way to the egg, whatever. Um, so by IVF, we, we cut out several steps of selection, and by ICSI, you're right, we cut them all out. Um, what's sort of interesting, we haven't done this uh, carefully, but this is just a gut sense, but we have the data to do this carefully. Um, it doesn't look like we have much more variability in gene expression when we do ICSI experiments than IVF. So if you were speculating that the sperm we take from the cotta has um, a wide variety of different sperm and you know 90% of them never contribute to uh, natural embryos, then we would expect to see those embryos bombing out more often or having gene expression stuff. Um, and actually, if anything, our ICSI data are always much more um, tightly clustered, although that's because we can time them to 25.2 hours, uh, whereas IVF, there's a four-hour delta. Um, but anyway, so in general, with the ICSI data, it's actually very, very um, uh, tightly defined in terms of gene expression, which ar argues against all these sperm being sort of phenotypically different. Um, Only the, uh, your generalized xenobiotic resistance is, is an amazing <laughs> observation. It's just wonderful. It. And uh, it reminds me immediately, of course, of Jelena Mann's study. I yes, don't know if you know very that, much. But yeah. you know where, she, for those who don't, uh, she basically injected the grandfather with carbon the carbon tetrachloride, you know, and they got liver disease and so on. Yes. But as you get, the, if you take the son, they're more resistant to carbon tetrachloride. You take the grandson, and you can inject carbon tetrachloride into their liver, and, and they, they seem fine. And uh, so it, this is extraordinary. I mean, it really seems to be uh, the message that you said at the end is that the phenotype is only revealed by interaction with something. And, uh, and I think it's terrific. I thought you would enjoy that. I mean, you've brought up, I've, the one time I saw you talk, you brought up that point. Yeah. on the TRF, you said yourself, you know, there could be other small RNAs that you haven't yet, you know, discovered or focused on. So what's your feeling, though, about how big a population of these RNAs might be? I mean, you know, you focus on the one most abundant one, one of the most abundant ones. So, so it would make sense that there's going to be a whole kind of range of these guys. Um, and ha have you any hints that there are? Well, so, I mean, there are another nine or 10 that are regulated, you know, that have copy numbers where we think the sperm is delivering more than, say, 100 molecules, right? If the sperm is delivering 10, you're not going to pay attention to it. Um, there's on the order of 5 to 10 of that abundance that change, uh, uh, that change abundance in response to diet. Um, we don't have, you know, for many of them, we just don't have any phenotype when we knock them down in the S-cell. So like turf gly CCC is also upregulated in low-protein sperm. Um, we just don't have a handle, right? We could chase gly GCC because we have a molecular handle for what it does. Gly CCC, we just, it doesn't do anything to ES cells by any of the genome-wide measurements we've carried out. So um, 
you know, eventually we're going to have to do things where we take, you know, Glide GCC alone, inject it into an embryo, and see if we get a phenotype in kids. Um, the only thing I can, the only comment I have in terms of, so we've never, we've recapitulated pre-implantation gene regulation with small RNAs. Um, the only people in a dietary paradigm who've recapitulated the offspring phenotype, um, there's Chi Chen and colleagues who purify bulk tRNA fragments uh, and got their glucose control phenotype. Um, so that argues that on mass, the tRNA fragments are sufficient. Um, and then Minu, Russell, Z Zadiga, and Zegede um, injects a single mirror, I think it's mirror 19, and gets a glucose control phenotype. And this again sort of raises the specificity question, right? So if all TERFs or if mirror 19 can both give you the same phenotype, is that just a phenotype that shows up whenever you like slow down the second cleavage? Um, just a quick question on the um, protection. Um, what about protection from biological agents? Biological agents? Yeah. Uh, like uh, bacteria or something like that. That's funny. You're at, yeah, so the other, we, the, the sort of specificity test we have cooking that is far behind the nicotine um, is infecting dads with flu. Um, so we can sort of do VDJ specificity. I mean, of course, it would be crazy to tell your kids about one, one VDJ. Um, but we haven't, we're basically nowhere, all we know is that the animals are different sizes if dad was infected or not. Um, but we haven't done that. <coughs> it would be worth, so one thing, you know, one thing that we now have to take seriously is, is the low protein phenotype in kids the same as the nicotine phenotype? So we have to start taking these different systems and doing the same tests in them, right? So we should take our low protein kids and try to kill them with nicotine. Um, and, and looking at, at um, that infectious response would be a nice one to add to the sort of set of things we do to the kids. But we haven't done, like, we've done literally nothing in terms of those tests. <coughs>